Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to this session uh, of our Higher Education Innovation Marketplace. My name is Jukka Tulivuori and I work as a social sector specialist in uh, ADB's education sector group. And today we are going to hear about the capacity and curriculum development in higher education. Uh, a very interesting session ahead of us indeed. And uh, as our speaker today, we are having uh, Professor James Holland from the RMIT. He will explain us uh, later uh what what's, uh, the college is about uh and he has been working and teaching there already since 1994 and now he is working as the director for the center for digital innovation so james the floor is yours thank you very much Yukur, and thank you for that kind introduction and thank you to the organizers of this ninth international skills forum for the invitation it's an honor and a privilege to be here to tell you about some of the work we're doing at RMIT. Let me just share my screen. So I've got some slides for you. Let me just get that underway and then we will uh, commence talking. Now, <clears throat> as I said, my name is James Harland and I'm the director of this STEM Centre for Digital Innovation, which probably doesn't mean very much to you. <clears throat> so let me, I'll explain a bit more about what that is and the context in which RMIT works. <clears throat> so forgive me for giving a little bit of that background because I think it's relevant to understand where we're coming from, what we're doing, and more importantly, where we're aiming to go in this exciting and innovative and great era of new technologies um, driving, um, transforming, and making education unrecognisable from back when I started all those years ago, Yuka, which I'm not very keen to quantify anything more than what you said, otherwise it gets a bit embarrassing, particularly with a, a little bit of grey in the beard here. So let me first explain what exactly is the context in which we're working and why this is something that I think is really, really exciting. So RMIT University, or the Royal Melbourne Institute of Technology, which is where the RMIT comes from, um, is uh, located in Melbourne in the state of Victoria in Australia. Now, its history dates back to 1887, when it was originally founded as the Working Men's College, and it's been through a number of different changes of name since then, but has always remained true to that idea of transformative education in a very practical sense. So now, some 130 or so years after foundation, it's Australia's largest tertiary institution. We have something like 90,000 students in a variety of different campuses. We have three campuses in Australia. We have two in Vietnam, one in Hanoi and one in Ho Chi Minh City. And we have a number of programs in countries outside Australia and Vietnam, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, in other parts of uh, Southeast Asia, where we have our programs taught often in partnership with some local uh, institutions. So it's a very big and diverse institution. And one thing, the very first thing we tell our students when they arrive is RMIT, RMIT is big, and that size brings diversity. And with that diversity, you should be able to find a home for whatever kind of interest you have. So that size is sometimes off-putting, but it does create a lot of opportunities. So a bit like Caesar's Gaul, if, you, if you're into that sort of thing, uh, RMIT is divided into three colleges academically. We have a College of Business and Law, and I guess that's relatively self-explanatory what happens in that college. We have a College of Design and Social Context, which is a rather unusual name that covers things like architecture, fashion, design, communication, media, and so forth. And we have a STEM college, whose name, I guess, is rather uh, descriptive, being about science, technology, engineering, mathematics, hence that's the traditional um, expansion of the STEM acronym. And in our college, we have four schools, one of science, one of engineering, no, not one of medicine, but we have one of health and biomedical sciences, which is that uh, medical kind of aspect. And we also have a school of computing technologies, which is where I, as a computer scientist, have spent most of my time. So it's very much the context where we're coming from, where within our STEM college, uh, looking at science, engineering, technology, mathematics, medicine, uh, those sort of technical uh, parts of uh, the university academic curriculum. But my particular focus is, of course, being a computer scientist uh, on computing. So what does that all mean? Well, the aim of the STEM college 
is to position ourselves as an innovator and leave it in STEM education by creating life-changing learning experiences for our students and developing a globally competitive workforce capable of driving transformations and growth in a tech-rich world. Now, that's quite a big and ambitious, bold statement. Well, we are a fairly large college, so having a big, bold aim is a good thing. From my particular perspective, the key words in that are being an innovator, a life-changing learning experience, and the tech-rich world. So those three aspects about innovation, about digital technologies, and about learning experiences, put those three things together, and that's where this Centre for Digital Innovation comes in. Our aim in the Centre is to develop world-leading practice in STEM teaching through digital innovation. Now, part of the reason we say that is that a lot of universities have centres of innovation or digital innovation or research innovation, which is great, and it often suits their particular context. But that's a very broad sense of innovation that might lead to new research outcomes, might lead to new engagement with the industry, or could also lead to new learning and teaching outcomes. I guess in this particular context, we are focused on learning and teaching outcomes rather than the more general sense of digital innovation. So to unpack that a bit further, our particular mission is to foster a culture of innovation within the STEM college and more broadly through strategic partnerships, research-informed leadership, and digital solutions and learning and technology in STEM. What that basically means, we're a bunch of geeks who are curious to see how we can transform the world with what we do with our technologies, if that, that's a bit more helpful than that sort of mission statement. Also note, we've only been in operation about six months now, since January 2021, so it's still a very new development and we're still feeling our way a little bit to exactly what our role in the overall ecosystem of a large university is. So just to ram that point home, this is me here, the Director of the STEM Centre for Digital Innovation. That is one third of the staff because there are a total of three staff in the centre. One is myself, one is our digital solutions architect, Ian Peake, and one is a software engineer, Jack Belcher, who's also a graduate of RMIT. So it's a fairly small centre to start with, but we like to think that this is the start of something bigger as we go forward. Now, just to uh, emphasise about the importance of learning and teaching for us, my boss, the person I report to, is the Associate DBC Learning and Teaching and Quality, we have four associate DVCs in our college, one for research innovation, one for strategy and partnerships, and one for international uh, relations, as well as the ABDC learning, teaching and quality. That really reflects that our remit is about learning and teaching. So it's very much in that particular focus. There's also a dotted line here, you can see, which in management speak is what I call my other boss. I have my boss and my other boss. My other boss is the Dean of the School of Computing Technologies. So that very much points out we're a centre of innovation, but again, it's about particular computing, digital, uh, specific technologies rather than technologies more broadly. So that's very much the context of where we're coming from. And uh, for that matter, the person responsible for setting up this Centre for Digital Innovation is in fact our Deputy Vice Chancellor of the STEM College, who also happens to be our Vice President of Digital Innovation for the university. Now, a lot of that might seem irrelevant, but I guess it's really much that we have a lot of direction and a lot of support from the very top levels of the university for doing this digital innovation agenda, which we think is vital for not just universities to thrive in future, but even to survive. We think we really have to be in this digital innovation game. So for that reason, it's great to feel that there is that very strong support from the very top of our university for the agenda that we're going to be talking about here today. Okay, so what sort of things do we do? I'm sure that's enough about who I am and where I come from. What kind of things are going to be appropriate? What kind of activities do we do in the centre? Well, there's a number of different things here you can see in these particular bullet points, but there's an emerging agenda which we've been labelling virtualization of lab facilities. One of the things that the online uh, world we now live in, in the pandemic or post-pandemic world, is that we all know a number of things can be done online. But a better question now when we're moving, perhaps slowly we might want to, into a more blended era, where there'll be some things online and other things on campus or in person, what's the right balance? Now, in an area like computing, 
it might be difficult to see what that balance is given largely or even wholly for many computing courses, the entire course could be done online. However, in areas like bioscience, chemistry, physics, engineering of various sorts, there's often an important aspect of having lab facilities. And a lot of universities have quite rightly invested a lot of money in high tech facilities of various sorts. So one thing we're increasingly involved in is what we might call virtualization of those. I'll say a little bit about, well, about what that exactly means later. But the idea is having got these expensive um, and often facilities which are high technology, but often limited in capacity. How can we leverage those facilities more by having not just the physical ones, but also having virtual versions of those using augmented reality, reality and related technologies so that students can get their precious access to the physical uh, facilities on occasion, but anytime they like, they can also access the virtual one. So that's kind of like that blended learning. They have some things in the actual on-campus facilities, but there's other things they can do in the virtual ones. And there's a few different facilities at RMIT that are very keen on having this kind of duality. We've also had a number of conversations with various academics about augmented reality, and it's been a bit beyond saying, okay, so you want to use the HoloLens, what for? And a lot of the answers we get back are around what we've labelled here as augmented reality textbooks and exercises, or be able to do things that are, if you like, learning materials that are not just on the page. There's something one can interact with in a 3D sense and possibly manipulate, rotate or change. And that obviously gives a much richer experience in certain contexts, not every context, but there's certain contexts where that really does make a difference. We're also doing some work on what we've labelled a Socratic AI chatbot. I think a number of you might have used chatbots. It's certainly a technology that is uh, now available. But finally, the right way to deploy that sort of combination of natural language and some kind of uh, avatar or similar kind of uh, pop-up uh, image. One thing we've had this described as perhaps we want a less annoying version of Clippy, for those of you who might remember that iconic Microsoft uh, interaction from uh, a little while ago. But the idea here is to have leverage the power of those sort of natural language technologies to be able to simplify and amplify what we can do in a large course particularly. A particularly exciting thing I think is about intelligent assessment, which includes things like automatic grading. Now we can do automatic grading in the terms of a classic multiple choice quizzes which are present in every learning system around the world. We wanna go further than that to have something that could potentially mark paragraphs or short answers or other kinds of things that aren't as simple to fit into a multiple choice category in a quiz. Another issue that the pandemic has highlighted is accessibility. And I think a lot of um, emphasis now being on online work has very much also raised the level of urgency about making sure that those who don't have quite the same access, either because of internet connections or equipment, or particularly for things like special needs or visual impairments or inability to follow written material in some form. We also have to think about how we can make uh, our content accessible in every which way from the very beginning via technology. And there's several things we could talk about there in general. We're also very keen on a thing called light boards, which are kind of a way of um, reproducing what some of our mathematics staff had said, how can we reproduce writing on a whiteboard or a blackboard, if you're old enough to remember that, um, in a modern environment where we can live stream and record and do things like that? Well, light boards appear to be one way we may well be able to do that. There's also some talk about classrooms of the future, by which we mean visual tiled video walls, integrating various other things like that and potentially having some people physically present while others are present only via an online connection and finding the right way to organise that sort of interaction. And I think some sort of literal blending of the face-to-face -face and online would be inevitable in various contexts. We've got a few ideas how that might work out. Finally, there's also a need for if we, what we would call student-to-student -student interaction, which is also has to transcend or at least work within this blended environment. Now, that's a, an overview of the various things I can talk about. Um, I intend to talk for no more than about a further 10 or 15 minutes and devote the rest of the session to 
question and answers and discussion. So if there's particular things you see come up, please feel free to post them in the chat and we can um, either deal with them at the time or um, deal with in the Q&A session, which we plan to have for about 30 to 35 minutes. So I will very much put a limit on myself. I'm not going to talk for more than 10 more minutes, despite the fact I could probably, if you allowed me the freedom to, talk for a, almost an unlimited amount of time of, of any of these. So if there's anything of particular which you want to ask, please feel free to put it in the chat and we'll uh, answer it as soon as we can. So in terms of this virtualization, one of the things that we're starting off with is looking at health uh, clinical simulators. Now, you, have, you can see in the diagram here, this is a, looks like a hospital room. It's got the usual equipment. There's a basin, there's the curtains, there's the kind of hospital bed. There's even some equipment that's often commonly found in hospital rooms and so forth. But what you may not notice, unless you've got really keen eyesight, is that lying on the bed is not actually a human. That's actually a dummy. Now, the reason for that is this is part of a brand new uh, nurse training facility that is set up in one of the buildings at RMIT. There's I think four rooms like this, each with about four beds in the room, where we train nurses. And there's something like 300 students a year that take part in this sort of a program. Now, this sort of immersive environment is fantastic for teaching uh, nursing students about the kind of environment they're going to work in, what the kind of protocols they need to follow, where that, when and where they wash their hands, how they talk to patients, how they uh, hold certain equipment, what they do in certain situations. So these rooms are very much set up for simulated live training. Um, you can see the various equipment here. It's not actually uh, connected to oxygen tubes and things like that, but it's trying to make it as realistic as possible. The problem is even despite many years of work, we've now got four such rooms with about 16 beds, I think, in total. But as I said, we have hundreds of, of nursing students. So we obviously can't give everybody equal use of that time every week. But what we can do is amplify the use of that facility by having a virtual counterpart. So we can set up this, a, a virtualization using virtual reality of this particular room where students can prepare. So when they come to their precious time in the actual facility, they already know where the particular equipment's located. They know the various protocols they have to go through. They've been through some training already. So in that precious couple of hours or whatever their time is in the real facility, they can maximise their use of time rather than waste time saying, oh, I forget what I'm supposed to do here. I've got to look something up. It can also be used for revision afterwards. So having had that precious two hours, they might say, what would happen if I did something different or how did that work again? They can replay and revise within that. We've actually got a bunch of IT students who are looking at this and working on this as a semester project. So it's a great sort of student-to-student -student interaction as well as giving a slightly different perspective on how we might run with this. Now, this is particularly about health, but I think any particular laboratory uh, facility you might have, be it an engineering lab with uh, electrical engineering materials, be it a physics lab with particular equipment, be it a chemistry lab with benches and chemicals and so forth, you can imagine doing a similar virtual counterpart for just about any uh, facility you have, including robots or something like that. So this seems to be something that's going to be more and more common, having these virtual uh, counterparts to real uh, facilities in that sense. Now, one of the particularly interesting things about this is how do you do assessment in virtual reality? You can see here there's a potential nursing student here with a headset on. Well, with or without the headset, part of the issue is to say, here is a real patient, but we have certain things that the um, you can see the, the text prompts and things that... The assessor might be saying, well, have you checked this? Here's certain things to ask. Have you uh, followed this particular conversation protocol? Have you got all the information you need? Now, if we went to observing people for the purposes of assessment, then we want to make sure that there's a bit of variation in what they do. We don't want to have everything perfect and then someone come else, else come in and have everything go wrong. We'd like to see how the, the, the students go with a little bit going wrong occasionally, but somehow still giving everybody an equivalent experience. So it needs to be a bit of interactive narrative where there's a lot of working games and doing this kind of thing, but we wanna make it unpredictable yet fair to everybody. So if you like, if there's five things to do, we might wanna have three of them go perfectly, one go a little bit wrong and one be a complete disaster just to see how people react under different conditions. 
But if we had the exactly same script each time, then it's not particularly authentic. So there's a real role here for doing some kind of artificial intelligence to simulate equivalent but different scenarios for each student who's being assessed. So that's a fascinating challenge that we're, us geeks are very keen to address. A second um, use of augmented reality that's um, surprisingly rich is things like textbooks. You can see on the right hand here an engineering diagram in two dimensions, and this is the three-dimensional drawing of that same object. The idea is that in certain engineering disciplines, in this case it's uh, mechanical engineering, engineers have to be literate in these two-dimensional plans because they might go into an engineering co um, company or something like that where they have to have the ability to read these sort of plans and then visualise in their mind these 3D objects. So there's a clear role for showing these objects, perhaps rotating them, perhaps allowing the students to manipulate them, perhaps doing things like, well, first we show you the object without the holes, then we drill the holes so you can see how that affects the plan. But being able to think like this in this three-dimensional world from a two-dimensional plan is a great example of why the three dimensions are necessary. A similar thing applies in a lot of chemistry when we have chemical reactions that need 3D understanding. And there's things like right and left hand rules to work out if I've got this particular chemical here and another copy here, how do they fit together? And that's very much this idea of chorality or having three dimensional ways in which these particular things match. So the three, the, the three dimensional understanding will help understand how these chemical reactions are possible and under what circumstances they work. A final fascinating one is that middle one. You can see one of our lecturers in engineering here who's got a lot of work on building body implants for someone who might be uh, missing a, a digit or missing a leg, or in this case, having masks to put in things like um, MRI facilities. It's all about having these um, body implants which can be 3D printed, but what Kate wants to do is to be able to have a 3D simulation so you can see what it's like before it gets printed. So you can do your design work in the 3D AR kind of world. And when you're happy, you can then push the button that prints the particular outcome. So you can see here masks and for kids who are undergoing MRIs, often they want to print a Spider-Man or a princess mask or something to make them feel more comfortable than this rather ghoulish skull-like looking thing they have to put on top otherwise. So all of that is about trying to find ways that we can make these 3D things work in a more interactive way. Now note there's one question in the chat about what the requirements and standards in applying AI technologies in these facilities may be. Well, that's an excellent question. And I think a lot of the era when it comes to things like augmented reality or artificial intelligence in general, there's no written standards here in some sense. So we're gonna to have to discover these. So for example, in that nursing scenario, if we've got someone training with the headset on, what's the right length of time? We might think we can give them a two hour uh, lab or something like that, but is that too long to have a headset on and people start uh, their attention wanders or there's other effects of having that sort of technology on your head for a long time? We don't really know. Um, are there standards to apply in terms of what makes a fair assessment? What is the right attention span and things like that? We don't know. Um, in applying AI technology, there's already some acknowledged ethical issues in things like machine learning and having bias in data and ethics of artificial intelligence in terms of what, say, driverless cars should do in certain situations. In terms of learning and teaching, I don't think we've even begun to address those kind of questions, and certainly there's no emerging standards for AI applied in uh, technologies and facilities like this. So it's an excellent question. I don't think we've got any good answers at all because it's all, in some sense, still too new. Socratic AI, or what we call SOCI for various reasons, is an interesting challenge as well. One of the things we're doing in the college, there will soon be four courses that will be taken by every student in the college, no matter what degree they're enrolled in. That means there's going to be these four very large courses with something like 6,000 students in them. That's a very different scale than anything like we've seen otherwise in our typical, um, quest, uh, typical uh, courses. So that level of scale, it's like MOOC scale courses, if you like. How do we do that? Now, clearly, these are going to have to be online. There's no way we can have 6,000 students in a face-to-face -face course. But also, the normal discussion forums you might have in the learning management system in Canvas or Blackboard or Moodle or something, 
that's not going to scale for that number. Now, we do know that chatbots exist. There is that natural language technology and they're very focused on simple queries. But we want to be a bit more ambitious and say we don't just want to answer queries like when's the assignment due or how do I apply for an extension? We also want to prompt students, so be proactive, a bit like that clippy popping up and say, you appear to be writing a letter. Listen, might also do things like, you appear to be working on the assignment. Do you need some help? Or you haven't done any work in the assignment yet. Maybe you should start. So having that proactive part of it as well as a reactive one, waiting for questions, is going to be important. We also want to have it personalised. We don't necessarily want every one of those 6,000 students getting exactly the same answer, depending on the context of what they got or particular queries they might have asked in the past. So finding the right way to personalise these kind of um, interactive uh, technologies is an important challenge as well. And one thing I will note that our um, Dean of Diversity and Inclusion has stressed to me is that having something like this old white male here is definitely not the right way to have an avatar. Having something that is genderless and ageless, so something like a sock puppet, like this comment, this particular image, oh, my apologies, is the way to go. So there's an important aspect of understanding the users and what's going to work best for a diverse cohort of students and having that sort of understanding reflected in what we can do in, person, uh, in, in the, the way this thing pops up and reacts. So having something customizable is going to be important as well, not just to give people agency, but to have something they're really going to use. Now, there's a question in the chat about teachers being a huge influence on a student's choice of subject matter. One of the real challenges for teachers is STEM education, and how teachers can overcome them in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. That's another huge question. If you like, what makes people interested in STEM and how do we stimulate that interest? Well, I think part of that relates to the technologies we're talking about, certain areas like augmented reality or having these kind of artificial intelligence, natural language processing, so that not only are we up to the cutting edge of technology, but students can be fascinated by what's going on here. I think the appeal of the 3D versions of AR compared to textbooks is one thing, so that appears to be a lot more engaging, but also having opening up these sort of pragmatic aspects of having something to discuss or argue or play with you makes it feel less like a crusty, musty old scientific discipline with lots of books on shelves and uh, people in, in white coats and things like that. So I think part of it is using technology to break down the image of STEM as being this nerdy, very uh, uh, dry uh, subject rather than something that's exciting and engaging. So I think what we're also trying to do is not just make ourselves at the cutting edge of technology, but also to have a lot of um, engagement that we have with our students. Now, I know I've been talking for about 20 minutes, so I'm probably going to not go through all my slides, but I'm happy to answer questions. What I do want to do is mention one more development, if I may, and that is this one about intelligent assessment. I've mentioned these college-wide courses with 6,000 odd students each or something like that. Now, there's a lot of challenges in designing these courses, particularly with looking at a very broad cohort of students from computer scientists to engineers to physicists to chiropractors to people doing Chinese medicine, nursing, pharmacology. And so therefore we have to look at that what we call an architecture of stackable modules. That aside, to grade 6,000 students, particularly in a lot of these modules are three to four weeks long, then automatic grading and feedback is essential. Otherwise, we have this huge army of human slaves marking things to a deadline. That's not necessarily a good experience. It's also highly impractical. So we have an academic working on a, a system that's based on Jupyter Notebooks, if you know what those are. They're a Python coding uh, environment, but they're actually quite useful as a learning environment as well. Now, this particular uh, aspect of this is not just auto marking uh, computing answers where you might say, if the input is four, the answer should be 10. And you can easily test whether that's the case. But getting a bit more ambitious about automatic marking short answer questions, questions that might have a three or four paragraphs uh, answer. So how we can do things like that rather than your typical multiple choice kind of things. We also want to look at individualized assessments. So we might have the same process to calculate a particular um, differential equation solution, but each student gets a different set of input numbers. 
that not only, if you like, minimizes the, the temptation to copy someone, but it also means that they've got to focus on the process rather than the actual numbers themselves. Finally, perhaps a bit more ambitiously, we'd also like to do some machine learning for marking similar to humans for things like structured reports, laboratory reports, essays, or other things where there's particular things to look for. That's a bit more ambitious, but we think it's wholly within the power of the technology we have at the moment to do that. So again, we have a, a semester, a capstone group working on this in the semester. It'd be fascinating to see what kind of results we have in about uh, three months' time when they complete their work. Okay, I'm conscious of the fact that I haven't got through all my slides, which is fine, but I've also been talking for about 20 to 25 minutes. So I think that's probably more than enough. Um, are there particular, so I'll just skip forward to the end to put up the question slide. So thank you for your attention, but are there particular questions that people would like to ask, either in the chat or by putting up your hand? I'd be very happy to answer them. So do you have particular questions you would like to ask or comments you would like to make? Yes, we have a raised hand, uh, Dr. Rocky. Yeah, good morning, good morning. Yeah, my question is, uh, uh, the, the simulation is very excellent because we, we in our colleges faced a problem during the pandemic for hands-on session, particularly lab sessions. Uh, we tried in our capacity to uh, make some video recordings of the lab, which was a very conventional method. And the latest method, what we saw with VR and IR, it's very, very exceptional. And uh, the presentation was very, very excellent. It's very informative for us. My uh, my question is, if you have any, uh, where can we get these resources? If you can uh, publi uh, publicly, if you see in the chat or anything, if you give some links to the uh, links to those uh, resources, that will be very, very uh, good so that we can utilize those things. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Look, look, I think you're not alone in terms of videoing uh, lab facilities and experiments and that kind of thing. We've got another group at RMIT doing exactly that in some of our laboratory medicine classes this semester because we have some students who would normally be on shore here in Australia who have been unable to travel because of the pandemic. So we've been trying to find ways in which we can assist those students by having at least some, uh, some kind of experience, even if they can't be physically present. Now, we don't have a lot of outputs we can Hello. easily Hello. point to. Hello. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so, but I think we can have a lot of a more of that and we anticipate seeing more of that happen. I think the, the ultimately, though, videoing the labs is probably not going to be the greatest long-term solution, even though it's a, one we can do relatively easily. I think there's a lot more we can do with virtual environments such as Labster. So a lot of our um, um, science disciplines where they have uh, particularly biology and chemistry labs use things like Labster and other online um, laboratories to again simulate or virtualize the lab experience. It's not gonna be a replacement for physical labs, but it might be at least some kind of supplement to them, either because people cannot physically make it, or even if they can, to have that sort of same preparation and the same um, revision capabilities of the virtualized ones. So in that sense, having videos and labs is great. Having live attempts where people who are watching from afar could say, James, can you pick up that bottle and do that? And they can have some influence rather than just watching the result is also going to be important. So I think it's more about having bringing people into that facility virtually than just videoing, but videoing clearly is a great start for that. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And my last question is: uh, we are we are textbooks. I'm very very it's a, a very very curious, and uh, I was uh, put a little bit put into the from your discussion. Uh, that's what. Where can these resources are available? We are textbooks. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. certainly, I think having having textbooks that you know aren't just PDF or something that are interactive is a great thing. I think the problem then is finding out what is the right kind of content for it. So, for example, as a computer scientist, I could say, what if I could pop up a computer program or something? Well, that's not really much of an advantage, but it's trying to isolate the parts that would. So that engineering diagrams I talked about, there's someone who literally this week is working on that to try and create the way in which this is done, even for simple as saying, 
here's the 2D plan, here's the 3D object, and be able to rotate the object so you can see the different aspects the plan's written from. So it really needs to be something that's got the, the, the 3D aspect. So you've got to think a little carefully about exactly what the impact is going to be. Having said that, there seems to be a number of areas of engineering. I mentioned mechanical, but there's other ones that electrical and uh, chemical and so forth, where there'd be similar issues. So I think a lot of um, engineering is to do with design and having a 3D model you can do as part of your design process is clearly an advantage. Also things like chemistry and physics, where there might be planetary motion, for example, obviously having a 3D version of that is going to be far more uh, engaging and people get to the point far faster than looking at 2D models or even 2D videos of planets in motion and so forth. So it's a matter of picking the right material. It's certainly a great idea, but like a lot of them, it's got to be about solving and learning a teaching problem rather than about producing some whiz-bang technology. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah. There is a question in the chat about uh, investment in high tech facilities and equipment to develop um, TVET to meet its potential. Look, there is an issue with uh, finding those resources, even in uh, so-called more advanced countries, because some, some of them can be quite expensive. That's true. Um, I think we have to uh, find ways that make sense in local context. The question talks about donor-driven approaches to not work because as soon as the donor leaves, there's no particular ways of looking at. I think the key part is to work with developing countries or even whoever the context is to say, how can we solve your problem? And I think part of the problem with saying, here's some fancy technology, there it is, play with it, is the wrong approach. We very much say we start and finish with the learning and teaching problem, whatever that is. So if the problem is a matter of saying, I've got 50 students, um, most of whom are distributed physically, then how do we find a way to bring them together? Well, phones, internet connections or things like that are appropriate, but it's got to be from the local context as well. It's not much good saying, let's, let's all use mobile phones if there's no uh, mobile phone tower networks that are reliable enough to provide the level of data needed. So I think part of that issue is it's not just about donating, it's about working with whoever your particular partners are or whatever your learning context is, be it someone sitting in high-tech California or someone in the middle of Africa. You've got to have the solutions that are going to work for the technology that works in that environment. So very much a lot of our conversations are about um, staff wanting to say, what can we do? And we say, lots of things. What do you want or what do you need? Where is the learning and teaching need? And I think particularly for technologists like me, it's easy to do the razzle-dazzle and say, here's some wonderful things we can do. Um, but if we rattle off 15 technologies, none of which really make a difference, then we're wasting our time. So particularly in developing countries or where technology infrastructure cannot be assumed, the first and the last issue we have to address is, what is this, what learning and teaching problem are we solving? And then whatever potential solution we supply, how well did that solve the problem, if at all? Without that, I think all we're doing is um, playing with technology rather than actually solving problems. So that there's a lot more in, the, in that whole issue about developing countries and how we provide the right infrastructure, but it really has to be grounded in the learning and teaching realities. Other questions? I do get the feeling I'm talking too much. <laughs> what other questions do we have? And there's a question there about the solution can be sustained, so continue to solve the problem. Excellent point. I guess that's part of the solution that we would see it. One of the things I've told my, my two staff, both of them, is to say, we'd like to see a time when the centre is, if you like, no longer necessary. We at the moment are three dedicated staff who are doing this kind of transformational approach. But I don't want to wish myself out of a job, but I do want to say this is a role that if we're still doing exactly the same thing in five years' time, then we've essentially failed. Because as uh, Eloisa points out, if we cannot sustain the solution, it's not really a solution. So we see our role not as um, the eternal geeks always available on call to fix a problem. We like to think of ourselves as strategic consultants who can come in, do some work, upskill people uh, provide solutions that 
are then owned by the people doing the learning and teaching. So if you like, the centre for digital innovation doesn't really want to own anything. We want to have our agenda driven, owned, um, and uh, very much set by the learning and teaching experts. So one of the things I mentioned, the four schools, I said to the, each of those four deans of the schools, what are your learning and teaching points of pain? Let me fix at least one of those for you. So if you like, it's not my centre, it's not a centre that's owned by the people in it. It really has to be a servant to those who are doing the learning and teaching. Without that, again, we're doing exactly the same approach as in Naren's question about pushing technology where it's not necessarily wanted or belonged, or not, well, sorry, belonged, or it doesn't really belong, where it won't necessarily be sustained and it isn't in some sense organic to what we're trying to do. So if, if, if it can't be sustained without our input, then we've done something wrong. That's very much uh, the way we would view that. Uh, Marwan has raised your hand. Marwan, what is your question? Excuse me, sir. Uh, hello? Hello, yes. Yes, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I can hear you. Uh, okay. As we know, uh, higher, edu higher uh, education, uh, it calls for uh, highly professional lectures. Uh, how we can each year to be uh, applied in its specialization and uh, position for uh, each new? I'm not sure I quite understand the question. Could you repeat it for me, please? Okay. Hello? Hello, can you, I'm yes. sorry, I didn't yes. quite catch the question. Could you repeat it for me? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I'm I can talk, hear I'm you. Talk about about uh, higher education, uh, I said uh, it's called uh, for highly professional lecture, uh, lecturers. Mm -hmm. Okay, how we can each be applied uh, in its uh, specializations and uh, processions for each new? Well, if I understand the question correctly, I think that the role of lectures and the role of higher education, I think, has to be transformed. I think um, certainly in Australia where I am, that the lectures and traditional forms like lectures, tutorials and a very structured weekly environment has been unpopular with students for a long time. And a lot of the time they so-called vote with their feet. They don't necessarily turn up at 9.30 on a Tuesday to my uh, Maths 101 lecture, then 2.30 on a Wednesday to my Physics 405 lab or something. I think the pandemic has accelerated the trend away from very formal structured classes to becoming more asynchronous. So it's less about being at a particular place at a particular time or being online at a particular time. It's more about having more autonomous learning that can be done by viewing, for example, recorded videos or uh, PowerPoint presentations that have recorded shows that people can play as many times as they like, rather than saying, come to the lecturer, whether it be coming online or coming in person or some live streaming of both, to be listening to the guru. It's about having the guru design various resources, recordings, um, interactive materials using things like H5P, quizzes or other kinds of ways of engaging the learner that's very different from the tradition. So I think a lot of what we have to do is rethink what we're doing in the traditional forms of higher education and certainly there's a lot of talk around RMIT that lectures are now dead. We do not do lectures. We give workshops, we run seminars, we have interactive tutorials, but we do not run traditional lectures. So a lot of it is rethinking that model as to how do we both best exploit the technology, but also meet the expectations of our student body. I think there's a lot more in that kind of issue about exactly what higher education will look like in five or 10 years time. But as I said at the outset, I think if we don't change our model, then we're going to get bypassed for all kinds of other uh, kinds of education. So we sort of have to reform or get passed by, I think. Thank you. Thank you, you're welcome. Nori, as in the chat asked, who should be involved in implementing curriculum aside from admin administrators and teachers? What about the role of parents, local governments, private sectors? They have a big role to play too. Absolutely. I think, you know, the, um, one of the things about education, particularly in Australia, is that 
we've long moved away from the idea of a university or a school or some other educational institution being a font of knowledge and has all the expertise and, if you like, uh, dictating or are very much directing what students should do, what they should learn and how they should learn it. I think we're seeing a much more community-based role in terms of the various groups you've mentioned, local governments who might be involved in funding various things, private sector, industry, employers, parents or other stakeholders about what kind of education they want, what kind of things are important. So I think there's a whole role for a whole variety of people and that has to take place. Otherwise, again, if institutions remain in uh, some sort of ivory tower saying we have all the knowledge and we know what we're doing, then they're soon going to get left behind. So it certainly has to have all those people and probably more involved in the development of these kind of issues. Another question from Nori, what are the learners needs and issues that should be considered in curriculum development? What are the main problems and issues faced by curriculum development in this pandemic time? I think the curriculum issues are the same as they've always been, what should be taught? I think there are some um, areas where that has always been somewhat fast moving and one has to catch up. Computing technologies being one in particular, although there's certain areas of things like mathematics where the first year course in differential equations might have very similar outcomes to what was taught 20 years ago. But if the same kind of pedagogy and the same kind of tools and the same kind of exercises are used as they were 20 years ago, then that particular course is in trouble. So I don't think it's particularly about curriculum as such. I think generally academics in higher education, in my experience, generally do a pretty good job of staying on top of curriculum. It's where we tend to lack is being on top of not only the best technological tools, but also the right pedagogy and the right ways to uh, introduce students to authentic learning and authentic assessment. So it's about finding the kind of um, way to express that curriculum in a way that is not only appealing to the students, but also uh, pr provides the sort of skills and um, development that makes them employable and useful members of society at large. So I don't think it's curriculum per se, it's about pedagogy and the way we do things, particularly in this world where we're gonna have a blended year of some students online, some students on campus and students who may well be both on any different gap day or, or change their minds about coming in this week and I'll do the online version itself or things like that. But it's a very, very much a pedagogical and technological discussion rather than about curriculum. So Antuya asks, what's one of the best practices in development and implementation of higher education curriculum is alignment because it requires a strong correlation between goals and assessment and objectives and distractual activities. How do you develop curriculum mapping to determine curriculum alignment that faculty can use to transform more effect efficiently? Well, I've got to answer that the same way as the previous question. Certainly it's important to have constructive alignment between what is assessed and what is taught. And it's certainly been a strong axiom at RMIT in my experience that to be cynical perhaps, the assessment is the curriculum. In other words, if you don't assess it, it can't really said to be part of the course. That might seem a bit cynical, but perhaps another way to think of it is, if it's not worth assessing, why is it worth teaching? So in that sense, you, you do have to align your assessment practices with what you want the students to do. And I can tell you from long experience in Australian universities, if you don't assess it, students won't do it. And like I said, that's not just cynical, it's also about students saying, well, if you don't value it enough to give me an assessment, some feedback and make it worth my while for investing the time, then what you're telling me is that you don't really think it's important. So it, we do have to have that alignment. Now, the other part of your question is about how to develop that mapping. I think part of the issue is about really saying, what do we really need to teach? One of the fascinating things we're doing at the moment is transforming our first year of computing from traditional structures of four subjects done in parallel to one boot camp to be able to build up particular skills. Now, the reason I mention that is that we've often got a very traditional pattern of how we organise courses. We have our first year foundational courses, which are prerequisites for our second year courses, and only when we get to third year do we start seeing applications in reality. That's very much a traditional structure. We need to show the students the applications and the complexities right from the very beginning. So we very much want to make them useful and, if you like, have a truly agile education 
that gives them a little bit of a useful skill in their first semester or their first year, and then a bit more and then a bit more till eventually they get to the sort of graduate level and professional uh, understandings. But we don't do that in what you might call a layer cake, where there's a foundation of first year and having completed, say, first year, you've only got the foundations, but you can't really apply anything in practice. And maybe then in second year, you get a bit closer to that then maybe finally in a capstone project in your third or fourth year, you finally get to talk to industry and do something vaguely useful. That is a very um, old fashioned approach and I'll put up my hand as someone who's very much done that sort of thing in the past. But if that's the way we continue to think, we will not be here in future because that just isn't the way the world is working. That isn't the way the students are demanding things. And I think it's very much got to be far more agile and far more practical from the very first class about how we do these things. Otherwise, as I said, universities will have a very pristine and very useful um, environment, but they'll get left behind by society as at large. So simply, we cannot afford to do that. <laughs> Susan says she agrees with me. Thank you, Susan. I know someone's out there, it's great. So it's great to do. But I think creating conditions for learning is very much a, a mindset shift as well, be it technologies, be it pedagogies, be it curriculum. And that's also a big shift, I think. We have to get students to want to learn and learn to learn rather than teaching them. And we're very much seeing a shift in the language you use this because otherwise we're going to get a, a generation of people who just don't see what universities do as valuable. Then asks, is asked, are there existing online community of teachers and trainers globally who can share their online assessment models that can help other trainers design their own assessments? I'd like to think so. I don't think we've got an online, uh, obvious online uh, repository or community like that, but I guess this kind of conference is one such community. So I think there's certainly, uh, it mightn't be labelled as such, but there's certainly um, communities like this one and others where these sort of things get discussed. So I don't think there's a, a one place you can go to say, where can I find the, the world community on this kind of thing? But I think having the more we can share this kind of thing will work. The only caveat I would have is that there are a lot of local constraints on most um, pragmatic developments of curriculum, be it a government mandate, be it standard bosies for different countries, be it funding models, be it uh, contextual expectations, be it cultural ones. So while it's great to have such a community, I think a lot of the time these are often more local than global is often better, not because the global ones are bad, but because there's often a lot of local conditions that dominate um, or at least have a large influence on the practice of the students. For example, in my country in Australia, local students get government subsidised places. They're not fee paying per such and they're also not typically on campus accommodation. There is to some extent, but unlike say the United States, where it's very common for students to live on campus, it's fairly uncommon in Australia too. So, we can't always transfer the context between what works in the US and what works in Australia, despite a lot of cultural similarities. So I think I'd say that finding a local environment is often richer than a global one for those reasons. There's often a lot of these local issues that may uh, influence uh, much more what you can do in your particular context. Wow, there's lots of questions here. We might get through them all by 7.30, but we'll, or by, sorry, 7.30 my time, but we'll get through them as soon as we can. Um, Naren asks, there's a new trend of corporate universities that are operating to train employees. Um, that's certainly true. I think the era of a three-year university degree and certainly a two-year master's or something like that is something that will soon be a bygone era. One of... I forget who it was now, uh, the community I was in at one point, said, you know, the worst thing you can do for your students is allow them to graduate. I said, what? But that's what universities do. We're in the graduation business. We want to get students in education. But the point was, yes, but the problem is when you graduate, you almost now say, now my learning is complete and I don't need to learn anymore and I can go and work for the next 50 years in the same job. Well, that's a very 20th century approach that will not work in the 21st. We need to make education more agile. We need to make it less bundled up in a three-year package or a two-year package and more accessible as and when it's needed. So if you like the, um, 
you talked about it being irrelevant to industry needs. That's also important. I'm involved with a partner in Australia called the Institute of Data who run a three-month boot camp for people wanting to pivot from careers um, of a variety of sorts into those using data. And the point is in three months, they can get them to a certain amount of useful skill by focusing very much about what they need. That is the trend I think we need to look at in the future, both in terms of partnering with industry, but also on short-term goals that increase the productivity of people already in employment. That has to be the kind of role of education. There still will be some sense of building a base for undergraduate sort of study, but that also too has to become more agile and less about, well, come and enroll for this big chunk of years and when you finish, you might be useful. We've got to find ways that at every semester or every term or every whatever our teaching period is, that people come out with useful skills at the end of every one of those that contribute to their overall profession. Without that, again, would become very old fashioned. So it's got to be a lot more agile. Uh, how do the faculty members' different understandings and experiences influence their ways of engaging curricular development? Look, a lot, I think, is my experience, but I also think that a lot of the, the uh, information I see and the conversations I have we find a lot of the same issues come up. A lot of it's about engagement. A lot of it's about students not understanding. A lot, and a lot of it is about how do we do assessment. So I don't think different. there's a lot of difference between the issues in an engineering classroom and the ones in a psychology classroom or a computing classroom or a chemistry classroom. A lot of people have this um, mindset, which is quite understandable. Our students are different. Our students do this and other students don't. But the longer I live and the more people I talk to, the more uh, education systems I've, I've seen, the more and more the problems are universal. So I don't think different understandings and experience across the faculties or different kinds of um, academics are the issue. I think every staff member, every academic has a very different understanding of what they think education should be. So the problem is therefore about getting people to engage at all in many ways and to say, we need to change what you're doing. So that behind that question is the issue, how do we get academics to, to change their practice? Because it's very easy to say, I've taught this way for a certain amount of time, it's been quite successful and they may well be right, but you need to change, otherwise you won't be getting too many more students or the ones that do won't turn up to your classes or they'll find other ways around what they're doing. So I think it's, there's a lot of influence of people's experience, but I think it's almost got to a point where we have to um, advocate the case for change very strongly. Otherwise, we're going to find it's very difficult. A couple more questions than the time we have, have left. Um, interesting one about what's the most relevant person to develop curriculum in the system of education? By far, the person doing the teaching. At the end of the day, that's the one who's typically accountable for the class. They're the one whose um, practice has the biggest influence on the students and they're the ones who uh, the student look to to say, well, what should we do? So I think the most relevant person to develop curriculum is the one who's taking the class, the one who's the, the teacher, the lecturer, the person responsible for uh, allocating the assessment and the final, finalising the grades. Having said that, the, um, they need a lot of support. It's not something they can typically do by themselves. But getting back to some of the earlier points, if it doesn't start and finish with a learning and teaching issue, then whatever we do is going to be irrelevant. So it's by far about getting the people in the classroom involved and getting them to uh, develop the curriculum is the only way to succeed. How do we innovate the STEM curriculum in times of the COVID pandemic? Excellent question. I think to some extent, how do we not innovate? So, for example, as a colleague of mine in um, the biosciences area who last year was forced to confront the fact that a lot of his students would not have the same laboratory experience he would normally expect. He has become a champion for LabStar, which is a particular way of simulating uh, laboratory work. So I think it's not so much how can we innovate, how can we not innovate? Because there's a lot of changes, there's a lot of different expectations and just as the world of work, certainly here in Australia, we're not going to go back to commuting nine to five into a central office anymore. It's going to be far more about some time at home and some time elsewhere. Well, that change is going to, I think, 
coming in all parts of society to some extent. So it's almost like how can we not innovate during this time rather than how can we? Marwan, I'm happy to share slides. So the, the, I'm happy to share slides with anyone who wants them. So if you want the material, please, I'm very happy to do that. Wow, there's still a lot more questions. I don't think I'll get them all through in about one minute, which we might have left. So what I might, um, I might pick one more to do, um, and then we, we might have to call this to a close, I'm afraid. But um, I think just to pick one more or less at random through this, how do you use your experience technology to help independent learners prepare for assessment for recognition of their prior learning? There's a fair bit in that. I think part of it, independent learners, we have to create assume our learners are more and more independent, but by the same token, part of the reason they're learners is that we need to provide them with the right scaffolding, structure, activities, methods to follow. If someone said, as an, pardon me, as an academic, what's the most important thing you do? I would say there are two things. One is provide assessment, because that's their credentialing. And the other is about editing or curating material, not creating, but curating, taking what exists and saying, this is important, that's not, this is okay, maybe it is optional, this bit is fundamental. That, I think, is to answer your questions about how you help independent learners prepare for assessment. You, firstly, you align your assessment to your outcomes, as we mentioned earlier, but also you guide the students to say, here's what's important. Otherwise, it's a bit like saying, there's a library over there, all the information you need is in the library, go read it. That's not particularly helpful. Or in the modern version, the internet's out there, look up stuff on there, you'll find out anything you want. What I think we need to prepare our students for is saying, okay, you want to become a chemical engineer. Well, here's the skills you need to master, but also here is the way to master them. Here is a particularly important thing you need to look at. This is not so important. Here's the sort of things you're expected to do, so focus on these skills. So that curation or that understanding is important. And you've also mentioned recognition of prior learning. I think the way I'd flip that is to say it's also got to be relevant to each student's individual context. So maybe if there's someone who's um, been uh, working in the chemical engineering industry for 20 years, but is now under doing a chemical engineering degree to formalise their education, that person would probably need a very different set of activities or assessments from someone who's straight out of school but wants to become a chemical engineer. I think part of that is also being individualised and uh, not one size fits all. So that's also a challenge, but something that technology can help with having this kind of individualisation and that kind of thing. I can see there's lots more questions. Look, I'm happy to keep answering those and I'd be quite happy to hang around on, on the chat and answer those in the chat as need be. I am conscious of the fact we are now three minutes over time. So I think what I do need to do is draw this particular session to a close. So thank you for your interest. It's great to see there's lots and lots of questions, which is fantastic. But as I said, we now come to the end of our scheduled time. So thank you for participating in this. It's been wonderful to be here. Thank you to the organisers for the, the kind invitation. It's been a great privilege to be here. And I do want to uh, invite you all to come back tomorrow for day five of the ninth International Skills Forum, focusing on teacher professional development and teacher education. But for now, thank you for your attention and where I am, good night, everybody. It's been fantastic. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, James.